Today, I'm speaking with Sydney Davis Jr. Jr. Sydney, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked to be here, Tim. Absolutely. I'm excited. And Sydney is, uh, she's got a lot of stuff I'm going to share in this bio, but I'm going to start by saying she's a fellow YouTuber as well. She has a podcast called Growing Up Fundy. There's a link beneath this video. Please go like and subscribe and check out her great work there. But in addition to that, which we'll get into later. Uh, she's uh, from Nashville. She is in Nashville, Tennessee. She's from, originally from Arkansas. She studied at the University of Arkansas at Monticello. She has done a lot of stand-up comedies, including Trash, which was on is on Amazon still, right? That's awesome. So please go check her out on Amazon. Uh, she's a speaker and producer at the Conversation Coalition, which this was awesome. I didn't know about this before. It's a group of four atheists and four Christians who focus on having an open and respectful communication and dialogue with people who disagree with each other about worldview issues. So that's awesome. Uh, you can see those videos as well on her channel and on her Facebook page. She's a teacher at the Third Coast Comedy Club. She was the former producer at Stories from the Beat Lounge, as well as a former program director at the Chicago Underground Comedy Club and a producer at the Atomic Comic. And last but not least, she has 10 parents. <laughs> so Cindy, Ew, tell, us, tell us more about yeah, yourself. You you went, man, you got it. You got it. Um, yeah. So I've been doing stand up for 16 years this year. I realized at the beginning of the year that I've been doing stand up longer than I was alive, not doing stand up, which is weird. I started when I was in 11th grade. Um, I live in Nashville. I am from Arkansas, but I spent 15 years in Chicago, which is where I worked for the second city, um, the Chicago underground comedy. And, um, yeah. And so now I have a podcast and I think it, it, does a good job of melding my background as a debater when I was in college and my background as a comedian when I'm talking to people. I have I get a lot of comments where people say they enjoy the combination of really good cross-examination, but also lighthearted humor, especially with the, the topics that we cover. So yeah, yeah, a little bit of everything. I've had a lot of jobs. Um, I don't think I've ever just had one job. Even my first job, I had two of them at the same mall. So I'm a workaholic probably. <laughs> Mm. And what's the junior junior referring to? Yeah. So um, I tell people a lot of different things. I've got like 10 different fake stories that I tell people just to mess with them. But the real story is, um, yeah, when I started stand up, I was in 11th grade and me and my friend Tony were the only two teenagers in Chicago at the time that were actively out doing stand up open mics and participating in the scene. Nowadays, it's not that rare. Nowadays, there's a lot of programs and things for people who are under 21 but at the time that did not exist and so we got to do a radio interview at one point at um oh, uh, chicago public radio on and navy pier and right before we got started the dj asked me what is my stage name and i didn't know what that meant i was like what do you mean what's my stage name and he goes what's your name that you only use for comedy and at the time, my favorite movie was this movie called Everything is Illuminated. It's based on a book by Jonathan Saffron Foer. And the dog in the movie is named Sammy Davis Jr. Jr. And so just off the cuff, I said, Sidney Davis Jr. Jr. And he goes, Jr. Jr. I like that. This sounds good. It's got a ring to it. And you know, once you change things on Facebook, it stays that way forever. So that's basically what happened. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I got to ask uh, for your parents, for the ones that can talk back, do you teach them to cuss? One of them, I did not teach to cuss, but she knows how. So mm. we we rescue them. We Not all of them we've had since birth. And one of them surprised me not very long ago by telling me to go frick myself, um, <laughs> which awesome. was shocking. I did not teach her that. <laughs> what, do you think it was from watching TV or something? I think it was from Better Call Saul because we'd been binge watching Better Call Saul for like months at that point. Um, and that's, that's the hilarious. only thing I can guess. That's the only where, place she would have heard it because I know who I got her from. And he doesn't strike me as the type of person who would have said that very often either. So that's the only thing I can imagine. Mm. One more question uh, before we get into your story, just to, for uh, an introduction. With your background in comedy, do you feel like your comedy is in, in any way influenced by comedians that you saw or is, is it just stuff that comes to you or a combination? Like how did you evolve into that role or into that yeah, mentality? So I actually started stand up on accident. It wasn't ever a goal that I had. It was kind of um, an opportunity that just came up and I just took the opportunity to start it. I was doing improv at the time instead. And so I, I think I was probably influenced more by authors like David Sedaris or maybe late night television. Like at the time, I remember I used to watch Craig Ferguson every single night. He was just my hero. So I don't actually watch very much stand up at all unless it's people that I know personally and we're on the same showcase together. But uh, yeah, the influences definitely came more from storytelling or late night than any stand up comics, probably. Mm. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, everyone, please do check out her amazing uh, work there with stand-up comedy. But we're here to talk a little bit about something uh, slightly more serious, of course, which is your your exposure to Christianity and your worldview. So I would love to hear kind of where it started, like how were you born in a Christian family and you know what happened there as you were growing up? So when I was, it was a week after my first birthday, my dad actually passed away very suddenly. He had a heart attack and he died. So I was raised by a single mom and I have an older brother. He's about 18 months older than me, um, but he graduated high school like two years older than me. So I just always tell people he's two years older than me. But um, we were raised in Northwest Arkansas. I'm from Bentonville, Arkansas. But at the time when I was a kid, we lived in Springdale, Arkansas, which probably only matters to people from Arkansas. Um, and it's funny because when you said Monticello, Arkansas, in Arkansas, it's Monticello. So like you can tell uh, you're not from Arkansas because you didn't <laughs> say the uh at the end, the Monticello. Um, and Busted. yeah. And so we, uh, I lived there all of my childhood and we were always non-denominational, but I love to joke with people that just means you're Baptist because <laughs> that's, that's, I've never met a non-denominational person who wasn't Baptist. So um, I was involved in Awanas. Are you familiar with Awanas? Oh yeah. Painfully <laughs> like boys and girls scouts for yeah. church. Mm -hmm. But I remember when I was a kid, never really fitting in, in Sunday school. I really wanted to, but I felt like everybody else at the churches that we went to always seemed to have an established click with the other kids at Sunday school. And I had one friend and she was my best friend. So anytime that we would go to a different church, she and her family would also go to that church because we were the only people that hung out with each other from church. And so I remember always wondering what it was that made me feel kind of like an outsider. I, I would say I was bullied at all, but I definitely wasn't made to feel the way that I saw other people being made to feel when they would join, you know, youth group. And and I never felt like I wanted to spend any time with anybody outside of church, just felt very strange. And so I was actively a Christian until at least my mid twenties, I was living in Chicago doing stand up and everything while still going to church. Like it, it was not something that I left behind in any way. And it never occurred to me until I became an atheist and people started asking me if I ever made jokes about religion in my set. I never, never even occurred to me to do that. And so now I'm looking back and I'm like, maybe I should. But I, I don't know. Like, it, to me, the two parts of my life are so completely separate. It never even occurred to me to overlap them, which is an interesting thing. Now that I know what I know about storytelling and now that I teach stand up and things like that, if I were one of my own students, I would say you should you should dig into that. You should explore that. But for whatever reason, my brain's just like, nah, it just closes the chapter, which is probably for the best, honestly. But in my house, I grew up in a home that was quite liberal. Um, my mom was very much like, you know, learn to cook your own food, learn to do your own laundry. You don't need somebody like a husband or a man to do things for you or to take care of you. And it was from the perspective of see how quickly you can lose them, right? If I, if she didn't know how to pay bills or handle her own, her own responsibilities when my dad passed away, you know, she would have been SOL. And so it was always surprising to me that at home it was you can take care of yourself. You are independent. You can do this. You can do that. You can do anything you set your mind to. But then from the pulpit, it was women shouldn't preach. Women shouldn't lead people to the Lord. Women should sit at the feet of their husbands. And it was just very surprising to me that my mom would go to those churches and, and listen to those sermons. And so I remember once I asked her, you know, do you believe that? Do you believe that women shouldn't lead people to the Lord or that it counts less? I think I was probably 10 when I asked her that. Um, and, and I asked her, you know, is that, do you agree with that? And she told me, she said, you know how sometimes when we're hanging out with family and one of your uncles or one of your aunts will say something just, just crazy, just crazy, but you love them anyway, because they're your aunt or your uncle. That's kind of how preachers are. Sometimes you agree with the majority of what they say and you love them, but sometimes they'll say something that's just a little bit off the wall and you get to decide how you feel about that because you have a personal relationship with the Lord. And so the preacher can't necessarily dictate that relationship with you. And she said, you know, do you feel like if you told somebody about Jesus and they made it to heaven's gate, they would be turned away because they were told by you, a woman. And I said, no, I don't think so. And she goes, well, then I don't think so either. 
And so Mm. she was never the one that perpetuated, you know, women should be submissive. Um, A lot of the purity culture stuff, she was not that person. But the church was. The church was the one saying these things and basically equating your value to how pure you are, how righteous you are, how um, performative, basically, that you were. And I was I was like a precocious kid. I was always that kid that was asking questions that come across as sarcastic, but I genuinely just wanted to know. I was not trying to be an ass in any way. Oh, sorry, are we allowed to say that? Yeah, word? absolutely. Okay, perfect. Okay, okay <laughs> I forgot to ask. We cuss. Um, but I still was very curious and I had a lot of questions. And I later found out I also had ADHD, which makes a lot more sense now that I'm medicated. Um, but it just I wanted so bad to be a good Christian. I, if mm. like when, when I tell people that I'm an atheist and they insinuate, you know, that means you were probably never a real Christian to begin with. It's hard to express to people how badly I wanted to be a good Christian and how important it was to me to be the ideal Christian and how often I prayed and how often I tried to read the Bible all the way through, even when I was 10, 11, 12 how often I did devotionals, how often I prayed. Um, I remember there were times when I would try to um, record, like audio record myself reading the Bible, just things like that. And, and, you know, this was before social media, but I, I just remember it was so important to me to be a good Christian. And I really tried. I tried my hardest. I gave it my best. And it just it never made sense to me why it was so hard. And one of the things they teach you, at least as a Baptist, is that a lot of the responsibility is on you. So if your prayers aren't being answered, it's because you're not praying correctly or God is answering your prayers. You're just choosing not to see the answer that he's giving you. That's another thing they love to tell you is like, oh, it sounds like maybe you're being stubborn and God actually is talking to you, but you don't like the answer that he's giving you. And then you think, oh, maybe that is the case, but you don't know how else to look for the answer. You know what I mean? Like, okay, great. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I need to open my mind and I need to really see what he's telling me. But like, how do I see it? Like, how do I see that? Like, is it, I don't understand. Like, is his, is his answer to my prayers that he had me born in America? Like, did he answer my prayers like long ago? Cause he knew what they were going to be like, is that, I don't know. It did. Did he answer my prayers by like giving me a dog? Like, I don't like, how am I supposed to know what the answer to these prayers are? But it didn't stop me from just really trying. Just oh. and I remember mm. one of the main messages they also tell you is that you know as you get older and you go out into the real world, the real world is going to look like a lot of fun, right? Drugs are going to look like so much fun. Bad, nasty music is really going to be a bop, right? You're going to want to dance to it like your friends. It's going to be cool to do all these things, but that's the devil. Like that is the devil. Don't let him in. Don't you hear the birds? was that can you hear the birds in the background a little bit not too not, a little, not, they not all too just woke up at the same time <laughs> um they they do this <laughs> they little to, morning call they want to join um, in the interview yeah so um yeah and so it, when people say that when they say oh you must just not have been a, a good enough christian it's actually like no actually i think i was a better christian than a lot of you i think i was i think i tried a lot harder than a lot of people who claim to be devout christians do and i don't mean that in a way like i'm better than you i mean that in a way like you have no idea what you're talking about you have yeah. no idea what you're talking about but that i prayer... wanted okay it's again. no i was gonna say like i wanted god to be real so badly it took years for me to really come to grips with the idea that I just had no proof he existed. And not only did I not have enough proof he existed, but I had enough proof to prove that he did not exist, that it actually hurt really bad. Mm. You know? And yeah. and so that's why it always bothers me when when people who are religious say, well, then they weren't a good enough Christian after all. It's like, no, actually, they were so... It, like it mattered so much to people to be a good Christian that when it still didn't work, they were defeated. Mm. They were absolutely defeated. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was doing an interview or when I was first looking at deconversion videos, I saw one called Christianity Broke My Heart. And that mm-hmm. phrase really resonated with me. 
Yeah, because I mean, think about it. They tell you God is your father. God loves you. He he is like a father figure to his subjects. You know, you, you're you supposed to love him and worship him. And all the songs are about, I would give my life for the Lord. God is good. And where's he at? You know, like, where is he at? And I didn't think about it until later. But imagine, I already didn't have a dad. <laughs> the last thing I needed to do was have another invisible dad right like the the last thing mm. i needed was one more like I, like i don't understand what's going on why are my prayers not being answered why are my needs not being met and i don't mean that like food clothing shelter my mom was an awesome mom she did a great job like i'm appreciative every day but when somebody tells you like yeah god loves you he watches you all the time he knows what's best for you he is so proud of you and you're 12 begging god every single day to show you something, literally anything, like anything at all. And you're telling God, you're saying, I will literally be your servant for the rest of my life. I will screen your name from the rooftops if all you do is prove that you're real. That's all I need. That's all I need. It can be a code word. We can come up with a secret code word. It can be literally anything. It can be when I turn on the TV, if it's Bob Ross, that means God's real, you know, turn on the TV. Like it could be literally anything, but you're saying all I need is something from you to prove that you're here and you're listening and he still won't do it. It's like, I'm sorry, but there's, there is nothing righteous about that. There is nothing deserving of worship about that. If, if that makes sense. And so yeah. as an atheist, you know, people, people love to say like, well, what if you wake up tomorrow and science proves that God has been real the whole time. So what are you going to do? I, my answer is I'm going to believe in God. And they're shook. They're like, what? Like, what? What? Because they're so used to the idea of sticking to their guns no matter what. They're so used to faith being no matter what you see or hear, you have to keep your opinions the same. No, if science proves that there's a God tomorrow, I'll believe him. I'll be pissed about it. I'll have some questions. I won't worship him, but I'll believe him, you know? Um, and, and that idea, I think, is so foreign because, and it's not their fault. It is not believers' fault that that is how their brain works. It is the fault of growing up in a congregation that tells you, you do not need facts. You need to have faith. You need to, the, the blinder the faith, the better. And if you start to ask questions, that's the devil. And that's a problem. They trick you because they say, like, ask questions, go to your pastor, ask him anything you want, and he's going to be there to help you. He wants to lead you to the Lord. Then if you start asking the real questions that don't have anything to do with veggie tales or something like that, then it's like, oh, have you been wondering that? Is that a question you've been having a lot? That's kind of concerning. Have you prayed about it? Because this is like, not many people have this question. Uh Oh, it sounds like maybe you're starting to doubt God. And then you say, Oh my God, no, 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 of course not. Of course not. I believe in God. Like I would never doubt God. And then you never ask another question again, because it reveals you to be the weakest. link. And so something I've discovered and maybe this is your experience as well, maybe not. Something I've discovered about a lot of people who deconstruct from Christianity is say you are 19 when you start to doubt the existence of God, when you start to be like, I don't know that this is real. For the ages 20, 21, and 22, you are holding on to your religion and your faith so strong. You are overcompensating so much for the fact that you know you're starting to slip that it's like almost gross. Like I remember posting Bible verses on Instagram every day, posting random Facebook statuses that are like, God is good. And people being like, yes, God is so good. Because in my brain, I was thinking, this doesn't make any sense. My brain's telling me he's not real. I, I'm starting to question everything. That's the devil. Just like they always warned me what happened. And I cannot be the weakest link. I have to hang on to this life raft as powerfully as I can. So people ask, you know, when did you start to deconstruct? They started to deconstruct years before I deconstructed, if that makes sense, because I was hanging yeah. on so tight. I could not be the non-Christian in the group that failed. I couldn't be the one that didn't make it. I'd already been the weirdo my whole life. I'd already been kind of the black sheep a little bit um, when it came to youth group and church and stuff like that. I didn't also want to be the one that proved I couldn't make it. 
And so, and obviously nobody wants to burn for eternity, right? It's like, oh my gosh, I'm asking these questions. I therefore deserve to burn in hell for eternity because God decided when I was an infant that he was never going to reveal himself to me. Therefore, I am in trouble. I'm doing it wrong. It's Mm. just like, the time it makes so much sense at the time you're like yeah of course like god wants me to believe in him and like the whole point is that i i have faith so what is faith oh well that's believing in things you can't see as an adult i'm like no that's brainwashing that is brainwashing you're being brainwashed like you're you're and another thing that i try to convince people of that sometimes surprises people is when you first deconstruct there's so much anger that's why there's that that brand yeah. of the angry atheist. Because like the first two years, you're just fucking mad. You're just like, I'm just gonna, I'm just, oh, I'm so mad. It's true. But what what you can't do, as hard as it is, what you can't do is you can't blame the immediate people around you. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame your congregation. You probably can't even blame your pastor. Um, in look, obviously, in lieu of any like sexual misconduct or something like that because they are also brainwashed you know there in the atheist sphere there's this stereotype of like the evil pastor like bringing the congregation together and being like mm, like now i'm going to get my money it's like no no these people genuinely think they are doing the right thing they genuinely believe when they are standing up in that pulpit that they are being given the lessons by God through God to lead you to the Lord. Now, they still suck. Like they still suck sometimes. Not all of them, but some of them still suck. And like people's experiences with religious trauma, 100% valid. 100% valid. Like the when when a pastor looks at you and says like if you're gay you're going to hell like that is off but i 100 percent believe they think that is true when you get up to the you know mega church level i do think that those people aren't actually christians i think they're just businessmen who have figured out that like the fastest way to get money is to claim that like that's different but when we're talking about like local church you your family your pastor it, i try to tell people feel feel sorry, feel sorry for them because you are experiencing something that they will very likely never get to experience or have been experiencing for years and are scared and are in pain and feel like a failure and feel like the odd one out and they're hiding it. They are in their own type of closet in this situation. And they, they are so scared because in their mind, They've been having these questions and they're going to hell. Even if they don't vocalize them, even if they don't follow them, there's a sneaking part in the back of their mind that thinks I'm going to hell for just thinking this because God warned me about this and I did it anyway. Even though your brain is a brain and it does what it does and there's nothing you do about it, right? It's just this whole, you have free will, except you don't, except you do, except you don't, right? Um, And so... I forgot where I was going with that. Oh yeah. So I, so I held on for dear life. Like I held on, like it was that door in the movie Titanic, right? Like I was just, I was not about to be Jack. I was going to be Rose on the door. Um, but it just didn't make sense. And I was doing stand up, and I, um, was also going to church, but at the same time I was a professional debater. So when I was in college, I actually got a full ride scholarship to go to school, um, to nice. be in debate. And I love debate and I ended up about it, which which I still to this day love debate. And that's one of the reasons why I'm part of the conversation coalition. But it didn't make sense to me that every time I was at a tournament, it was like evidence, 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 and not just any evidence. It's got to be good evidence. Like miss me with Wikipedia, hit me with CNN, MSNBC, you know, um, uh, the history channel, whatever, like bona fide sources or you lose. But then on Sundays, it was like, I don't need any of that stuff, even though arguably eternal salvation is like the most important thing you'll ever talk about. So that's why in my early 20s, I was just so conflicted all the time because I was going to church. I still felt like an outsider. Even in my 20s, my questions were considered rude and sarcastic. And I was being confronted. You know, I'd left Arkansas. I'd gone to Chicago. I was being confronted with different types of people than I had ever met before. And those people were going to hell. Really? Like they seem like decent people. In fact, I like them a lot more 
than the people I've met at church. They've been there to help me when I needed help. They've been there to talk to me when I needed someone to talk to. They were the first people to befriend me when I moved to Chicago. And they're they're going to hell? That doesn't make any sense. Why would they go to hell just because one of them has a boyfriend and he's a man? Like that doesn't doesn't clock with me. That doesn't track. And so um and then I did shrooms one day. And I was never a Christian again. <laughs> I'm not I'm not advocating people do shrooms at all. That that's not this was a unique case and I've heard of people who had a real bad time doing the exact same thing. But what it did for me personally was it brought all the questions I'd been asking myself for years at that point to the forefront and it never let them go away again. You know, in my day-to-day life, I could ask a question and I could just stuff it down and be like, "No, no, 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 no. no, no. That's don't stop that. Like stop that. That's you and the devil just getting on like friends." But when I had my psychedelic experience it was like no this is really who you are stop lying you're lying to yourself i'd say you were lying to god but he's not real um and you're lying to everyone around you by pretending to be a christian and when i was doing stand-up i oftentimes performed on this sunday morning showcase at the second city it was 9 a.m on a sunday i don't know why so many people were seeing a live show at that time it was so early but it was packed every time and then immediately after i would walk a few blocks away to the church i was going to and so the comedians who would do that show, they would often get brunch or whatever afterward. And, and you know, normally they would say, where are we going to brunch? And I'd say, oh, sorry, I can't. I'm going to church. I remember the day where I asked the group, so where are we going? And somebody looked at me and they were like, don't you have church this morning? And I was like, and they said, okay. And they never asked about it again. They never questioned it. They never made fun of me. You would think that the, you know, ragtag group of like unemployed comics would be the ones to to rib me about it. But now that I know what I know, I think so many of us had a very similar experience that they had also deconstructed at some point. They just didn't have a word for it. And so they just weren't going to touch them, I think, may be mm. the case. But yeah. And so I just, I realized, I, I don't know if you've ever smoked weed, but when you smoke no. weed, and you ask yourself questions you and you write them down. The next day, you're like, these are the dumbest questions I've ever seen in my life. This is so stupid. But when I wrote down the questions I had on shrooms and I read them the next day, they were still really good questions. They were mm. still really valid questions. And they were all about faith and God and Jesus and the Bible. And I just, I, I tell people... I went into it a Republican Christian and I came out of it a Democrat atheist and just that quick. And I wonder all the time, all the time who I would be if I did not have that experience. Again, not advocating it for everybody. It can be a real bad time if you're not in a good space mentally, if you're not with people you can trust to take care of you while you're tripping. Um, also, I tried to watch Hunchback of Notre Dame once on shrooms. It, it was a horror movie. Don't do it. Uh, even the animated one. But that just happened to be my personal experience. And so I it did not make me think those things. I had already been thinking those things for a long time and just ignoring them. And all it did, all it did was make me go, this is who you are. Why are you lying? Um, and it, a lot of people think that atheism is a decision. It is not. It is not a decision. I cannot with clear conscience tell you that I believe in God, that I believe the Bible, that I am a Christian, I would be lying. I am an atheist. I did not want to be an atheist. Um, I enjoy being an atheist now, but it was never my goal. It was never, oh, if this doesn't work out, I'll just be an atheist. <laughs> like I'll just be a YouTube atheist. Like That seems like a formidable career. Um, you just, it's it's like I, I imagine the same way that I w- I'm straight right? It's not a choice that I make every day. I don't wake up every day going, I am going to be a heterosexual woman. I just am. That's just how my brain operates. And so, yeah. And so I I think now that I look back, I think the reason why I never fit in with all the other kids, I never fit in in youth group is because I was always asking questions. And I think think even back then I was an atheist. (laughs) I think even back then I was smart enough to know none of it made sense because I was Southern. I was polite enough not to point it out. And then as I got older and a little less polite and a little less popular, um, no matter how hard I tried to be a Christian, I was an atheist, just like I could try all I want to be attracted to women. But I can tell you from personal experience, it would not work. Um, I would still I would be lying to somebody, either myself or my partner. So, 
yeah. And, and that's basically kind of how that happened in a nutshell. Um, and, and I have, I have no ill will towards Christians at all. I do not hate God. Uh, a lot of people think that if you're an atheist, you hate God, but believing in God. And I, I hate him the same way that I hate Bigfoot. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I guess, like, I mean, never met him, never seen him. Uh, it's like saying I, I hate the cat in the hat. I don't. And he's also not real. So that would be strange. Um, it, it's so interesting to just to look back through the mentality of a Christian and to think that like, you're you're so convinced you're so indoctrinated into the idea of god existing that even the idea of people not believing in god means they hate him not that they literally do not believe in him i do not hate god i do not have any animosity towards god because he's not real because i don't believe him right i also don't have any animosity towards the boogeyman i don't have any animosity towards santa or the easter bunny like you know what i'm saying and so well, it's amazing too that they they preach. Of course, honesty is is an important character quality, and they want you to be a, a person of integrity. But if you're yeah. honest and you're being a person of integrity, you're having to admit, I just don't see this as reality. And yeah. yet they're saying, in one sense, yeah, but you have to. You you may not yes. think it's reality. You may think you don't have evidence for it, but you have to tell yourself you do. And if you don't think you do, trust us. You, we do have enough. You're just your sin and your, you know, your worldliness and the devil have deceived you, you're self-deceived and you're arrogant, you won't bow your knee, but you have plenty of reason to believe the fact that you exist, that the world exists, um, that there's beauty in the world. That's enough to say Yahweh is the real God and he's he's really there in the Bible's his word. And it is, it's crazy that, that they want you to say, I believe, even if you truly have no reason to, and they can't stand it. And they, they just, they cannot stand that you would say, no, that has nothing to do with my life or reality. It just, it bugs yeah. them so bad. Well, and I think the reason that is, is because they literally cannot fathom what you mean by that. So for example, people ask me, they say, what do you think happens after we die? And I say nothing. And they say, so like, we're just going to be in this dark abyss for eternity. And I'm like, no, because that's literally something. That's still something. There's going to be nothing. And they're like, so it's just going to be this void. No, no, it's, it's going to be nothing. Like there's going to be nothing. If you've ever been under anesthesia, it is the most nothingness to ever nothing. They told me to count back from 100. I said 100. I woke up three hours later. Nothing. Not blackness, not a void, not I can hear, but like I can't, like literally nothing. And I think it's that same inability to process what that means that in their mind, not believing in God means believing in God and being mad at him. And if you change the word God to anything else, it makes sense. But for whatever reason, when you say God, it doesn't. For example, if somebody says, do you believe in ghosts? And you say, no. They go, oh, so you're mad. And you're like, no, no, I just don't believe in ghosts. Oh, so like you don't like him, right? No, I literally just don't believe in ghosts. Is it because they didn't reveal themselves to you? Is that why you're so upset? I'm literally not mad. I don't think ghosts are real. But like, what if they were? What if they were? They're not. I don't like, I don't, we could have this conversation all day long. I'm not mad at anybody. I don't think he's real. Um, and I mean, no disrespect towards people who do. It's something that I try to, to, to get to people is I have no issue with God. I have an issue with religion. I have an issue with religion. I have an issue with the rules that religion places on people. God did not give me purity culture, the church did. God did not give me the performative nature of um, songs and uh, hymns and things like that. Religion did, you know, like a, a lot of the problems that we face, people who have deconstructed or people who have religious trauma, God did not do that. Their religion did that. Their, their rules of whatever denomination they follow, even if you're non-denominational, still a denomination, um, those are what mess people up the most and the verses that were written by men by human beings in the bible that are supposed to be the rules you follow that's what messes with people that's what sticks with people that's what ruins lives so even if god were real i'd be like yo what's up with that like why why have you not struck by lightning some of these churches that are so harmful if they're truly not sharing your message the way it's supposed to be what like 
you're just not going to do anything about it. Like at least Jesus flipped a bunch of tables when he walked in and people were selling stuff in the church. Like at least he did something about it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of people thinking that they're supposed to hate you and be mad at you for the way that you believe and trying to turn around and have grace and forgiveness and understanding for those exact same people because we all fear what we don't know. We're all terrified of what we don't know. And when you tell people that you're not a Christian, the majority of their fear comes from the idea of you burning in hell. So the worse that people take the idea that I'm not a Christian, the more I can tell they care about me as a person because they genuinely think that I am damning myself to burn in hell and they are so upset about it and they are devastated and they think that I wake up every day and I make the decision to bring myself closer to hell and it's just baffling and it's traumatizing for them right and um it's just it's such an interesting existence and the trauma thing too I just to add to it something or a related word uh the terror terror of it all I've got a friend uh over in the UK who talks about this a lot um but he he points out that what you're implying, even if you, even if you don't say it to them and then spell it out this way, what you're implying by your atheism, both by your saying, I don't, I don't see evidence for your worldview being reality, and I don't see evidence for the Bible being divine, but you're implying to them, uh, yes, according to their preachments, you're condemned and going to hell unless you change, but also you're implying to them a couple of things that are, that are terrorizing to them. Number one, you're you're truly wasting your your one life. You have one life, and you're wasting it. Um, number two, you know, even the Bible, uh, Paul says, if you know, if the resurrection's not true, that uh, if Christ is not resurrected, then you're of all people to be most pitied. Like that, all of a sudden, your life is truly um, sad now because you, you've you've not just um, wasted your time. You've truly like been part of a deceptive cult, and you're passing it on to children and so forth. And so everything is just this huge loss. But then on top of that, I think the idea of if you've really convinced yourself that your loved ones that have passed uh, are going to be, you know, the the death didn't really stop your, you know, your communion with them. You're going to be with them again very shortly, relatively speaking. And to think, actually, no, that when you when you saw them at their funeral and you thought, I'll see you again soon because you're a Christian, I'm a Christian in reality, that was your final goodbye. You just what you yes. weren't prepared to admit it. Yes. And and you realize in a sense, Christianity is depriving you of the ability to truly grieve appropriately and properly and thoroughly. But yes. to, to for them to put those pieces together, it's it's kind of like I had this heard this one guy say, if you were, you know, married and your spouse is in the other room and someone comes in and says to you, your your spouse is a jerk, you know, really awful person. Well, you can kind of argue against that. No, no, he's he's really nice. He's you know he does this for me. He's caring, but if someone says your spouse actually is not doesn't exist, now you're talking about like a beautiful mind kind of stuff. Like, what do you mean he doesn't exist? Like, I, I've I spoke to we had breakfast this morning. Like, no, no, you it's he's not there. Like, and all of a sudden you're realizing my ability as a Christian to perceive the world is completely suspect. Maybe I'm truly seeing things that aren't there. The terror of all that combined is just, it's just too much. And they just, they can't face it. Plus, in, in addition to that, realizing that if they even entertain the possibility that they go down this route, such as you and I have gone down, all their, their family members and their friends and their, their colleagues that appreciate their, their faith being strong are going to say, you're, you're being so foolish. And you know, the foolish said in his heart, there was no God. Why would you choose such a foolish thing? And they realize they're going to, you know, one way or another be shunned. And it just, it adds up to a, such a ball of, of terror to them. It's like, I can't even, I can't even go there. I can't even imagine going there. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's also interesting how we are always encouraged as human beings to be curious, to be smart, to be this, to be that. And then when that curiosity carries over to religion, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Pause, pause, pause. Like, do good at the science fair, but please don't ask me for proof of God. <laughs> like, please, like, no, 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 no. When we said be curious, we meant like elsewhere. <laughs> we meant like at school with your friends. Yeah. And so I think I wish that that atheists would stop being angry at Christians just because, well, some Christians, just because 
as you stated, it's all out of fear. It's all out of fear. It's all out of fear and it's out of terror. They're not afraid that you're going to like discover their devious plan. You know, no, no, no. They're like, oh no, you are literally more willing to burn in hell than to continue being a Christian. Like you are more willing to say whatever happens, happens than to continue being a Christian. Oh no, that's terrifying. That's so scary. What are you doing? What about your loved ones? And then when you say, I don't believe in heaven, they're like, well, you don't think you're going to see your loved ones again? And you're like, no. And they're like, wait, what do you mean? No. Like, <laughs> What do you mean? No, I don't understand. You're supposed to see them all. Isn't that the whole thing? Um, nope. Sure isn't. In my on that, opinion. On that note for you, did you feel the the, the pain of well, like when you realized that you were admitting that Christianity was probably not an accurate worldview. Did it hurt you to think that the heaven you were expecting was probably not going to be in your future? Yeah. So I never thought that heaven sounded like a great time, to be honest. And I was like, singing and dancing for eternity with everybody I went to church with. Oof. Like, <laughs> no thanks. I don't know about that. But um, yeah, you know, you definitely go through a mourning process where you're like, man, I'm literally never going to meet my dad. I'm never going to know him. You know, I'm never going to see my grandmas. I'm never going to see um, like anybody that, that I ever cared about who died. Nowadays, I'm actually I'm relieved by that. I'm honestly relieved by that. I'm relieved that their suffering is over. I'm relieved that they've been at peace. You know, I'm relieved that there is no watching me from heaven, wishing that they could talk to me, waiting for my arrival, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to me, it's actually a lot more peaceful now that I'm no longer a Christian, but there's definitely a mourning process for sure. Because again, I wanted to be all those things. I wanted to be the best Christian I could possibly be. Even if heaven didn't sound like it was a great time, it sounded a lot better than the alternative. So, you know, I'll, I'd rather party for eternity than burn in hell. But um, now I'm just like relieved. I just relieved. I'm like, now I don't have to worry about losing my salvation, right? I don't have to worry about disappointing God. I don't have to worry about loved ones like watching me have sex like from heaven, you know, like, no, no, no. They stop watching then. How do you know? Do you talk to them? Like, it's weird. Like, how do I know everybody else's relatives aren't watching me? Is there just like a, is there like one tunnel per family and you just get to watch your own family? Probably not. Probably not. If everybody in heaven can see everything that's going down on earth, there's probably some creeps. I was yeah. creeps creeping and, on people. At least God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, for sure. Right. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, like all jokes aside, it's more of a relief now, honestly. It sounds peaceful. Hmm. When you were talking about your situation with your dad, it, it, number one, mm -hmm. of course, broke my heart for that incredible loss at such a young age. Do you feel like when you were a Christian that there was a real strong sense of like that that was a, a restored part of you that just you did have a father figure that was at least, you know, in some senses looking down in love and just saying, I just care about you. And like, what do you think things that kept you in it for a longer period because of that father figure concept? Yeah. So I, I was one of the lucky ones in terms of, I had a lot of very positive male role models in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that there's, you know, there's all sorts of statistics about people who grow up without fathers and the, the mental health issues they have and things like that. Um, I, I don't feel like I experienced that, you know, obviously nobody who has mental health problems thinks they have mental health problems, right? Uh, but I, I, I had a lot of positive male role models in my life and my dad was kept alive very much through stories, through pictures, his art. So this is actually this painting or this image behind me is actually something that he drew. He was an artist. Um, so it was never something that I wasn't allowed to like talk about or learn about or anything like that. Um, but later on as an adult, I look back and I'm, I do wonder if there was something there at the time, never thought about it. I never equated Holy father with actual father, because in my mind I had a dad, you know, he, I knew what he looked like. I knew what his name was. I had a lot of people tell me funny stories about him. I knew what I did that he did that was similar. I knew that we, you know, signed our name similarly. I had seen his artwork. I had read some things that he wrote. So to me, I had a real dad. He did seem more alive by everybody telling me that he was like watching me from heaven and he was proud of me and stuff like that. So he wasn't like entirely dead to me, but um, I, I never 
thought about it from a perspective of like, oh, God is my dad because my real dad can't, can't be here or something like that. But as an adult, as a grown up, now that I'm two years older than my dad ever was, I look back and I'm like, maybe there was something there. Maybe that did impact me more than I thought, you know? I don't know. Yeah. I've sometimes wondered that. I think it's hard to always tell because for me, my deconversion was um, much more about the mythology side of it. But I think there were there were some ways in which like my dad, I, my dad did live a fairly long life, but he was not a good guy, um, you know, said some really bad stuff to me over the years, just was a real jerk. So, you know, there's there's ways in which, you know, even having a dad isn't always, you know, um, the always a healthy, you know, environment. But I, I do know that for me, that that concept of a father figure, just in general, for, of, of your heavenly father. Yeah, it was drilled into me so, so much, and especially this idea of like the the prodigal son story where you know the father is just like like you you can't do enough to piss him off he loves you so much more and even though your your sin has offended his holiness so badly and he definitely has to deal with the sin issue and preserve his holiness at all costs his love is still so great that from your perspective as the recipient his love is just super abounding and so yeah. I just, I always had that concept in my mind of like, I just need to stay strong in his love. And I think you mentioned, you know, the idea of not asking too, you know, too, too many of the hard questions. I think for me, there was a sense too of, um, I'm not sure if I can think of a really great example, but if you were to to maybe watch some movie where there's just some, some old sage, maybe he's a wizard or something, but somebody who's got knowledge of magic or, you know, the, the, the great beyond or something that's just, they're truly a wise well beyond their years. And they just look at you and you might have a question for them. Maybe the character in the movie has a question for them and they will, they might get, get an answer, but the answer doesn't satisfy them. And it's like this, this issue of like, just trust me, I'll take care of it. I got you. And the idea of just kind of falling into the love of God in every sense, it's just like a, as if the ocean so you're plunging into the middle of the ocean and everywhere it just you know, up, down, left, right, everywhere is just love. And I think that that sense that it, eventually God is going to explain the questions. He's going to explain these hard answers, even if it's not till heaven. But in the meantime, while you're dealing with these hard questions and while things don't make sense, and you're like, God, where are you? Why don't you show up when you? F- I feel like you should. At the end of the day, he has done everything and then some to love you. And to, to make sure you're going to end up in in a wonderful spot, and I think that in many ways kept me grounded, uh, so to speak, in Christianity because I just I couldn't imagine for the longest time not living with that as just my basic worldview perspective. Like, you know, let everything else be 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 false, let every person be a liar, but God is true and He is love. And when you when you realize, I, th- I think one of the hardest p- things for me is, um, you know, when you talked about how people say you know, you hate God. It's like, no, I don't, I don't hate, hate God. He's just not there. But I also acknowledge in the same, in the same breath, it's not that I don't need his love. It's that he's not there to love me. And I'll, I'll, I'll often say to my kids, cause I do a lot of things to protect their minds. I'll say, did you know, at church, did you hear the song? Jesus loves me. So yeah, we did. I'll say, but you understand Jesus doesn't love you. I say, it's not because Jesus doesn't love you. It's because Jesus isn't real. And then, you know, they understand that and it helps them a lot to protect their minds. But I, I, I think just understanding that concept that that we have to psychologically pull ourselves away from this incredible need that I mean, we've been sold this bill. It's you know you're sold this first. You're sold this huge need. That you're so sick, and you need mm-hmm. His love. And you're so empty. You've got this void, this God shaped void. You need Him there, and you're you've convinced yourself thoroughly. They've convinced you. You've you've convinced yourself. You need His love beyond anything else, and to realize. You you didn't need it because you never had it. You never could have it because it was never there in the first place. And I think thinking through some of those things that gets kind of weird in some of the, when you try to go too deep in some of that. But I think for me that that helped a lot to realize you're not fighting his love. You're not you're not being arrogant against him and saying God, I don't you know screw your justice, screw your authority, screw the Bible. You're not screwing him. You're just saying I don't think he's ever been there. Yeah, yeah. You're you're saying screw him the same way that you would say screw old saint nick yeah exactly i mean i guess if you want to yeah like i'm not you're not wasting any energy on that because there's nobody to waste that energy on yeah exactly Mm. was you as you were getting into some of those deeper questions and before you were out 
did you feel like you were going through most of it alone or like, did you were you able to talk with your, your mom or anyone else did, or was it just like you of flying solo? Just on that? me, just mm. flying solo. Um, at the time, this was probably 2015, 2016. I was dating somebody who was one of those militant atheists, one of those like angry debate atheists. And but you were a Christian enough, dating an atheist. Mm-hmm. And okay. oddly enough, I think that his terrible attitude tripped me Christian even longer. And then when I realized that I was an atheist, I actually felt like I couldn't tell him because I felt like he would take all the credit. He would mm-hmm. like chalk it up to like one more way that he was like better than me. And he like taught me how to be better and more right and more correct, um, which toxic relationship. Glad that's over. But yeah, you would think like, oh, yeah, I bet you made a bunch of friends with atheists. No, actually, I didn't because I was afraid that they were all like him. And I was afraid that everybody was going to be like, told you so, you know, dummy, yada, yada, yada. It's about time. Glad we stepped in, you know. So I actually didn't tell anybody. I did not tell anybody until I didn't really talk about it at all until maybe a year ago, almost two years ago when I started the podcast. That's when I was really like, okay, this is an open part of who I am as a person. Now, if people would ask if they were like, are you a Christian? I'd like, no, no. Mm -hmm. Are you going to church? Absolutely not. Um, But I think the podcast was really the first time that I openly said it. And I didn't even openly say it on the podcast for probably 30 or 40 episodes because I wanted people to listen to all of my guests and not feel like there was a bias. Because, you know, I interview Christians, I interview atheists, I interview Muslims, I interview people who practice Judaism, I interview everybody, whether they're still religious or not. And so I didn't want anybody to go in thinking that there was like a predetermined agenda. And then enough people asked me, where do you stand? Like, whose side are you on? That I finally made an episode about like my story, my life, my thoughts, things like that. Um, But Mm. yeah, it, it wasn't something that I felt like I had to necessarily come out about. I do know that there will be a time that I do. I do know that there will be a time where I'm at a family event and somebody who's listened to more podcast episodes than I gave them credit for is like so you're an atheist, like in front of everybody. And I'm going to have to be like, yeah. And then it's going to start a fight. I'm sure. Um, but that wouldn't, that probably wouldn't surprise anybody in my family. I've always been kind of strange. <laughs> I've always are been you, the one that's like the the black sheep for sure. Are you able to talk with your mom about it? Nope. nope. Um, it's not that I don't want to. She's just never really asked about it. So um, I don't know until she does. I, it's, it's not something that I feel needs to be said unless it's part of a conversation. Like, Uh, I've been asked in the past to like pray over holiday meals or whatever. And I do it (laughs) just because it's like, I don't want to start a fight on Thanksgiving. (laughs) Like it's fine. At the end of the day, when this is over, I'm still going to be an atheist. (laughs) Like this, this is this moment praying over dinner is not going to, you know, impact my salvation in any way. Um, But I don't feel like it's one of those things where I need to be like, everybody needs to know. And if you're a Christian, get out of my face. Like, I also don't tell people I'm a Democrat, but you can look at me and make some pretty, some pretty accurate assumptions. I think, you know, you can, you can check out my life and be like, she seems pretty liberal. She doesn't seem very Christian. I don't think, you know, Um, but it's, it's not something that I I feel like I need to tell people uh, for any righteous purpose of any kind. Cause to me, that would be just as bad as trying to proselytize to everybody in a Christian way, you know? Yeah. Now, as you on this side of it, as you're looking back at it all, one of the topics that comes up a lot is just the idea of religious trauma. What things have you had to really kind of unpack? And I know for for me and other people have said this too. It, it feels like you you think you've unpacked it, and then you realize there's deeper roots, and you pull those up, and you, there's roots under those. But in terms of like just the the big things that you can you can identify, you can mm-hmm. think through and work through. What are some of the the things that you had to figure out in terms of healing from religious trauma and just getting back to square one and saying, I'm going to reclaim my identity and my autonomy and my own, you know, be safe in my own skin again? Yeah, great question. So there's been, uh, there's been things that were obvious. And then there's been things that I didn't, I never would have even considered until I started talking to people through the podcast. And I was like, oh, I had no idea that was linked. For example, the obvious stuff um purity culture you know the the idea that i remember when i made out with a guy for the first time i was like i was literally 20 years old and i walked around for like a month just being like oh my god i can't believe i'm such a slut like people and literally we just made out like i was still a virgin and everything but i remember just being like i can't believe i did that like that's so disgusting like oh i'm just 
like where it's going to get around campus that I'm just like the slut who will just like make out with anyone. Oh my gosh. Like I can't even believe that. Like the guilt just weighed on me. And nowadays I'm like, girl, you were a 20 year old virgin. (laughs) Like, what are you talking about? Um, And I remember that like whenever I broke up with that guy, he like complained to everybody that I wouldn't sleep with him. And I was like, so relieved. (laughs) I was like, oh, now everybody knows we didn't sleep together. Nowadays I'm like, who cares? Literally who cares? Like that guy's an ass, but like, who cares? Like, So what? What if you had? Big deal. Who cares? As long as you're being safe, just like nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, that sort of stuff, like a lot of the stuff that we're talking about in society right now, like consent, um, it's not your fault. It's not the way that you dress. It's not like you didn't invite these behaviors. It's not your job to make sure that you don't like turn people's gaze you know away from god or whatever um so that's like the obvious stuff you know you being being nicer to people who in the past you would have been like oh they're like a promiscuous slut it's like no they're actually just a nice person (laughs) like who has activities they enjoy that just involves the opposite gender um but then other things that you don't think like I have a, one of the complaints I get the most from people I've dated in the past is that I don't ever allow people to help me. I I do. I think that I have to carry everything myself. I think that I have to take care of everything myself. I think that I have to like, no matter what, it's all on me. And then I get overwhelmed. And I realized just like a couple of weeks ago that I think that comes from the narrative in at least American Christianity, where everything is your responsibility your relationship with God is on you. Your prayers being answered or not is on you. Your um, ability to to be a Christian or to be righteous in any way is on you. And I think I subconsciously took that with me, even after I'd completely deconstructed from Christianity. I think this idea that it's all on me, it's all my job, it's all my responsibility, our, even though you're in a relationship with people, separate people, it's up to you to make sure that relationship stays strong and stays dependable and i really think that comes from christianity i think that comes from the idea that it are the holiest relationship we're supposed to be in is all our job and if it goes south it's your fault and you're Mm -hmm. not working hard enough and i think that's why all through a lot of a lot of women all through their 20s will work really hard for the crappiest relationships like we don't actually even want to be with these people for a very long time but the idea that we didn't work hard enough to make it work i definitely think comes from a religious place for sure and i think it just takes us 30 years to figure that out hmm. it's amazing when you when you're saying that cuz it i know that theologically the pastors and the theologians would, would all say like, no, you don't have to work for your relationship. That's the point is that God did all the work for you, but practically what it amounts to is the opposite. And it's, it's amazing how it works, how, and that's, it's almost like, um, um, I don't know if uh, gaslighting is the right word, but there's, there's these ways in which you're like, you're, you're told one thing and then you have to live, you're forced to live another. But if you, if you admit it, you say, yeah, I'm, I'm living, because I have to, you know, perform, they're like, no, no, but you, you're misunderstood. You're doing it wrong. And, and now you're to blame again for misunderstanding. It's like, just go back to this simple faith. Let Christ, you know, Christ is living in you. The spirit is doing it. You don't have to do anything. The fruit of the spirit, he's, he's the one, you know, you're the, you're the one that's just sitting back and letting him produce the fruit. And yet, you know, there's obviously verses that say the opposite, such as, you know, work out your faith with um, fear and trembling. And if you don't have faith uh, or, or faith without works is dead, but you still get this strong sense in the Protestant church, at least of like, it's just faith alone, just rest in God and he'll do it. But practically it doesn't work that way. And you do get blamed a lot, at least in a lot of church cultures. And I think it, it creates a, for a lot of situations and topics, it creates like a dual world for you where you're, you have this facade of like, I got it together. I'm doing good. Uh, you know, I talk a lot about, you know, uh, sexual things with, with uh, some guests where I'll talk about how these, these guys that I was going to be um, getting, a, you know, we were getting a degree to be pastors at, uh, at Bible college. And these guys, we would talk in the men's dorm privately, you know, like Bible study time. But, you know, we talk about real life, you know, we're all guys, you know, that even the, even the uh, Dean of Men isn't there. It's just us, just real, just the students. You can be honest. And they're like, oh, I'm struggling with with pornography and masturbation so badly. And you're like, 
you're intending to be like the main pastor of a church in like two, three, four years, and your walk with God is just crumbling. But you knew that, that you know, outside of that group where you obviously, you know, keep everybody's secret secret, that outside of that, you've got this facade of, no, I'm, I'm a good Bible college student preparing for ministry. And I just, my heart is just on fire for the Lord. And you you end up being crushed, not just by the reality of this isn't, this doesn't feel like I'm actually like, it doesn't feel like Jesus's yoke is easy. It doesn't feel like his burden is light. It feels like the opposite, but you have this extra burden of not just what you're feeling in that private relationship, but the burden to, to pretend it's not that way. Yes. And you just feel like yes. I got to, and especially if you get towards ministry where you're like, no, you have to be an example. The joy of the Lord has to exude from you, especially if you're up on stage. Yes. Yeah. And I think I've noticed there's two ways that people handle that. They either struggle with the same thing everybody struggles with when they pretend they don't. So everybody else pretends they don't. So everybody's going, oh, God's love is easy. And you're like, yeah, but everybody's having a hard time and they don't want to be the first one to do it. Or somebody is struggling with something that is really hard to hide. And so they do that whole, you know, I struggle with this too, everyone. And the congregation is like, yes, yes. Like you're a human, you know, like when the, when the pastor's like, I actually, I, I'm going to be real. I'm the God has called on me to tell you the truth. And I struggle with pornography and people are like, wow, like what a virtuous man. Yes. Like tell us all about your real struggles. So there's like, you're either lying by saying you're not struggling with it or you're lying and you're using it as a way to show people like, see, we're just like everybody else. We're human too. Um, and nobody's just being like, is anybody else like hating this? <laughs> like, is anybody else just confused at how this is supposed to better my life? Cause so far it's only made it worse. I don't yeah. know. And maybe to the, the crux of the matter, where is the power of the gospel? The gospel is supposedly so powerful. And I'm, I remember for me, one of the biggest things that just it hit me in waves is realizing I was, I was aware uh, as a, maybe as a young adult of endless people who spent their entire lives in church and listening to Christian radio. Some of them would listen to it for hours and hours a day, even like my own father, who was uh, very much a horrible man. But, you know, he was a Bible school, a, a Christian school teacher, preached in church. He, he had Christian radio on for hours a day. I mean, it was like it dominated our house, just preacher after preacher preaching. And if it wasn't that, it was, you know, hymns playing. But it's like, if 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 this is truly the power of God to transform your heart, then why are you such a jackass? <laughs> and but you'd see like everywhere, like all these Christians are so rude. And I don't know there's, there's always going to be, you know, diamonds in the rough. There's some really sweet Christians, Yes. Yeah. but I would, I would by and large be like, if the power isn't in me or when I do feel like there's power, I feel like it's just me being self-disciplined. It's not like yeah. the spirit. It's not being self-disciplined. That's why I'm showing up big and doing the right thing. Uh, but all these other people that are in, in these circles, they're, they're just, there's no power there. And I think no. that wasn't, again, enough to get me out. My my route to escape was was comparative mythology. But it's like the, it's like the seeds, like there's a seed and you can kind of ignore that one, then ignore that one. But eventually like, okay, there's a big enough seed that just blows it all up and you realize, okay, there's a lot of other seeds that have been blowing, yeah. blowing it up along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why I love the question that, I mean, I get this a lot. I don't know if this is your experience where people are like, so if you're an atheist, then why don't you like steal and kill and rape and do all those things if you don't think there's a hell? And my response is, is hell the only thing keeping you from stealing and raping and murdering? <laughs> like, wait a second, like, hold on, let's back up. I am I just don't do those things. Like, they, those are just bad things to do. Is Stay Christian, please. <laughs> like, please exactly. keep going to church, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy how they don't they really don't put those pieces together, and it it, it also it's it disturbs me. I was going to say about Christians, but just it disturbs me too that I didn't put these pieces together. That the morality that they're often talking about is based on this book where their their Yahweh character, their their hero, the God, the demigod, is is such a sadistic psychopath. It's like his preachments are awful. Like if if you have a book that's preaching genocide, land theft, slavery, stoning, child brides, and worse genital mutilation, like that's where you're going from your, your morality. And if I reject that, you're saying I have no morality. So the fact that you accept it means you have no morality okay. and it's just, but it's, it's bizarre how it works. It flips on its head. Yeah. I get no prize at the end. 
You do. I don't get anything. Who's the one? Who's the moral one? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Well, that works. Hmm. But yeah, if you're listening to this and the only thing keeping you from being a rapist is uh, heaven, please stay in church. Thank you. <laughs> well, someone. I do want to also ask the, the word fundy. Your, hmm. your podcast is called Growing Up Fundy. Yeah. For anyone that doesn't really know that, and obviously that's short for fundamentalist, but hmm? For anyone that doesn't really know that background, could you talk about what are the main things that come to mind when you hear the word fundy or fundamentalist? And as you're as you created the podcast, you know, maybe a second follow-up question to that would be what was your goal in creating the podcast in terms of what what topics are you trying to uncover there? Yeah. So for anybody who's unfamiliar, a uh, fundamentalist is a term that you use for people who follow the fundamentals of the Bible. I think a lot of people have heard the terms fundamentalist. They've heard evangelical. A lot of people don't know the difference. So an evangelical person is a person who follows the Bible, but they have a belief that's a little bit more fluid. So they're the people who say, oh no, it was a different time. What he actually meant was this. When he says this, what he really meant was this. Fundamentalists are the ones, a true fundamentalist. I know some people call themselves fundamentalists, but they're not actually, are the ones who say, yep, that's what he meant. That's it. Like, what about the verse where he says, if you're not a virgin on your wedding day, your father should stone you in the middle of the town. Uh, yeah. Like that's what I, and that's why I don't really believe people when they say that they're fundamentalist, um, especially if they're divorced or they weren't a virgin when they got married. I'm like, you're not a fundamentalist. No, you're not. Um, give me a rock then. <laughs> um, but um, so that's basically what that means. And fundamentalists are often Calvinists, like people who believe that your um your destiny is predetermined by God and there's nothing you can do about it, or people who anybody who reads the Bible and says, yes, it is fundamentally true. Jonah was really swallowed by a whale. There really was a worldwide flood. There really was Adam and Eve, and they were truly the first people, and they were actually factually kicked out of e of Eden, that sort of thing. So I call myself Fundy adjacent. I personally did not grow up in a home where fundamentalist values were the values. I did, however, go to church with fundamentalist people. Um, one of my claims to fame is that I went to church with the Duggars for like 10 seconds, uh, but this was before they they got into the whole IBLP stuff. So a lot of people think I'm former IBLP. I am not. Um, and so when I, the way that I first started the podcast was I was telling my boyfriend Vince about growing up that way and like what Christians believe and, and things like, um, like the rapture. And he was like, have you ever talked to anybody about this? Which is interesting because I've been in therapy for years and I've never once touched on Christianity, which I probably should. Um, and I was like, no, I actually haven't. And he was like, I feel like you should tell people about this. He probably meant get professional help. I took that as you should start a podcast. So I started a podcast and I awesome. posted about it and I wanted to have guests. And the first episode was just me describing the background and what to expect. I really wanted to have guests. And so I posted on my Facebook um, about two years ago. I was like, hey, would anybody want to talk about this? And that's when I learned how many people I had known and I had known well for years that grew up in cults, in fundamentalist households, in the worldwide church of God, in like just wild backgrounds. But because I knew them and they were comedians, actors, writers, very performative, very funny, very promiscuous people, I had no idea that they had grown up literally in religious cults. And so one of my friends reached out to me and she was like, hey, I'd love to be a guest on your podcast, Emmy Award winning writer. She was my, my first guest, second episode, and grew up in, in a quiverful household, grew up in like an IBLP adjacent household. I had no idea. And once I realized that, it was no longer funny. It was like, oh, no. Oh, no. There are way too many of us out here. And I started getting people messaging me being like, oh my God, nobody's ever asked me to talk about this. I would love to talk about this. And so now... I've talked to so many people who are scientists, psychologists, writers, professors, comedians, actors, you know, writers, just all sorts of people. And they're like, yeah, I grew up in this really messed up environment. Let's laugh about our religious trauma. Because I, I tell them all the time, I'm like, the only reason we're so funny is because we were traumatized, which I fervently believe. Um, that's why all the people who grew up in like that. normal households, they're not very funny. Right? They're like, they, they don't have a reason to develop those skills. 
And so that's that's kind of how that got started. And so it's a good point though. You, that... you have to kind of laugh at, at I mean, yeah, you you obviously had to do some crying and some anger like we talked about, but you don't have to laugh at it. Like I believed in a God who liked to cut off the end of little boy's penises. I used to pretend to eat somebody's dead body and drink their blood. Like that's kind of weird, but it's kind of funny that I took it. Like like why was <laughs> yeah. I so whacked in my head about this stuff? Yeah. Like why was it so I, I use those uh, Stockholm syndrome phrase, like, why was I in love with my captor who was a psychopath? But when you get out of it, you're like, all right, you know, you do your healing, you get grounded, and then you kind of laugh at yourself like, this was really stupid, but all right, you know, it yeah, is what it is. Yeah. Here I am Yeah, now. and there have been multiple episodes where we've just been busting a gut. And I've had to tell the audience, I've had to be like, we're not laughing because this is funny. We're laughing because we both understand, like we both feel like, so it, we're, we are cracking up. We are like crying, laughing, but like only because it is such a ridiculous thing to look back on and be like, that really happened. And that happened recently. I'm only 32. And I think I, I officially labeled myself an atheist, maybe in 2016, maybe. Um, I don't remember if it was pre or post election. It was around that time, though, um, because, you know, so many Christians were coming out of the woodwork and being like, yeah, the president can say whatever he wants, even if it gets you grabbed in places you don't want to be grabbed. You're like, whoa, that sounds like the opposite of what you've been telling me my whole life. So, yeah, so it's it's hilarious. But also traumatizing. <laughs> I think to go into what you just said, too, that I think the part of it that's takes us back out of comedy um, is just the idea that there there are a lot of people that truly do want to take over the world for this stuff. You know, Christian nationalism is very real, and very real. I think even if if it even if that isn't when everybody's radar, just the idea that this stuff is psychologically abusing to children. I mean, when you tell kids at the youngest age, there's a guy up in heaven who can see inside your brain, not just what you do, but he can see inside your brain. So every time you're thinking bad thoughts, or you steal, or you want to steal. He's not just seeing it, but he's angry at you, angry enough that he has to kill his own son and torture him. You're that wicked. Um, just in that, you know, if you don't love him back the way he loves you, you're going to burn in hell. I mean, and endless other stuff. But, you know, you you do that to kids and this is nasty stuff. And it's like yeah. it, it it does. It breaks your heart. It, you, know, you laugh at it and then you're like, oh, but it's still happening, you know, and it, yeah. I think it inspires some of us like yourself to, to say, what can I do to get involved in the conversation? Yeah. And they say things like, uh, at least in, in uh, Baptist Christianity, they say things like, once you're saved, you cannot be unsaved. Once you, you've saved and you've accepted Jesus into your heart and like Christ as your savior, you are saved. You like, there's nothing you can do to lose God's love. And then at the exact same time, they're like, ask forgiveness, ask forgiveness, ask forgiveness, ask forgiveness. And you're like, wait, wait. So, have I like, have I been redeemed and I'm making it into heaven or do I need to ask forgiveness? And they're like, both. and you're like, wait, but I'm confused. I thought when I accepted him into my heart, that was all I needed to do. I am infallible. I can make it to heaven no matter what, like God has redeemed me in my sins. And they're like, that's true. And you're like, so why am I asking forgiveness? And they say things like, well, you know how your parents love you no matter what, but you still need to apologize to them when like you've hurt their feelings. That's kind of what that's like. And then when you're, when you're 26, and you're in a relationship where you're being treated like shit and you're apologizing for it. People wonder why you act like that. They're like, why can't you just get a better boyfriend? It's like, I don't know. Maybe because you told me that no matter how much a man loves me, I still need to ask his forgiveness because I did something that he knew I was going to do that I didn't know was a sin. But I still need to ask forgiveness, even though I supposedly can't lose their love. Like, do you see? Like, do you see? Like, but yeah, it's daddy issues for sure. So that is, it's not religious trauma. It's not the Bible. It's, it's the fact that I just didn't have a dad growing up. Yeah. That's definitely where that comes from. Like I've got daddy issues. Father God, father God is my daddy issues for sure. A hundred percent of the time. A hundred percent. I was curious, speaking, speaking of Christians, uh, do you get people trying to get you back in where they kind of say like, look, you, you must've been exposed to the wrong church. You didn't hear God's voice. You're under bad ministry. Uh, pastor didn't expound the word of God to you appropriately, um, whatever it was, you got some kind of misunderstanding, but and obviously the, the big ones, you know, you, you, you wanted to sin and you, you obviously um, were w wanting to buck God. You didn't want to bow your knee, all that typical stuff. But people are, like you mentioned before, that, that if they're really Christians, they, they truly believe this stuff. They want to, I would think, want to get you back in. 
have you had Christians try to reach out to you? And what are the typical, how, what kind of conversations do you have with them? And and, and even on your, do you have anyone on your podcast that that's a Christian that's ever said, mm-hmm. yes, I'll tell you my story, but you can tell as they're telling the story that they're actually trying to like, like, do they do or they're trying to weave it back to it and say, let's, pre- let's bring this back to you, you know, Sydney, you need the gospel here. Yes. So with me personally, I think I exude enough confidence where people understand there's not going to be any changing my mind, whether they think it's a good thing or a bad thing is yet to be determined. But I think because it's like literally my whole brand, I think they understand it would be a waste of time to try and reconvert me. What I get a lot, what I get all the time is Christian parents asking me what my initial questions were and how they can help their Christian children with those questions. So like I have a lot of Christian parents ask me, what was it that the church did that made you feel bad? What was it that they could have done differently that made you lose faith? Um, Which I think is great. um, But I always, 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 always make sure that they know that they should not have to convince their child or like manipulate their child. I said, if you if you really want your child to believe in God, if you truly want your child to be a devout Christian let them ask questions, let them research, let them watch atheist videos, let them listen to atheist podcasts. Because in my opinion, true belief, not belief out of fear, not belief out of fear of ostracization, ostracization, um, true belief is when you have been exposed to other ideas. And at the end of your research, you say, you know what, but at the end of the day, I still feel like this is the best route for me. Um, I said, let them look at it. Let them read it. Let them talk about it. Don't make them feel bad about their questions. That is the best way to determine what they truly believe. Um, I said, and also, if they start to not believe, don't make them feel bad either. Because all you know how they say, like, all you're going to do if you try to tell your daughter not to date that boy is you're going to drive her right into his arms. Right. And if you if you try to tell your kid you're not allowed to be an atheist, they're going to they're gonna be an atheist. I promise you. <laughs> because me, I promise you. I wanted to be a Christian so bad and I still ended up an atheist because everybody told me not to be one. Um, but I, I do tell them all the time. I'm like, let them ask questions. Let them watch people like R and Raw. Let them listen to podcasts like mine because they need to know what the opposition is saying. They need to know what people are are talking about who don't believe in God and they need to decide for themselves, is that a good enough argument? Let them listen to it. Listen to it with them. Talk to them about it. Ask them what questions they have because if they don't feel like they're doing it in secret anymore, they'll still go with you to things like church and Sunday school and stuff like that. Um, I do not think that that is a great thing. I'm very careful when I'm answering these questions because there isn't a good way to keep your kid a Christian because it sounds like no matter what you are forcing them, you know, Um, the best way that I can explain how to keep your child close to you and maintain a good relationship with your child. And perhaps that involves staying Christian is allowing them to ask you anything and talk about anything and question anything and let them get upset and let them be confused and let them like voice their opinion. Like it doesn't make sense in Genesis when it says this, it doesn't make like, why would God want me to do that? Let them be mad about it. Let them be mad and let them understand that like sometimes the rules don't make sense. Or maybe God is kind of vindictive. Stop telling them that God is perfect because he's not, you know, and that'll make them feel a lot less bad about being imperfect. Even God gets upset and strikes people with lightning or burns down towns, right? So they're allowed to be upset today. Um, But that I get that a lot. But I think I exude enough confidence in myself as a person that people, they're just not going to waste their time and they're not going to waste my time trying to convert me back into Christianity. And they've never been able to like, gotcha. They've never asked me a question that I couldn't like go off on a diatribe. No, like I think about God so much more now that I'm not in, not a Christian than I ever did when I was a Christian. I, I've read the full yeah. Bible. I looked up Bible verses. I do more research to support Christianity now that I'm not a Christian than I ever did as a Christian. So I think I think people understand like they're not going to get me. I'm not one of these people out here that are just, you know, like a Reddit atheist. Like, I'm a former debater. I like to think I'm an intelligent person. 
you know, I, I'm medicated now. So even ADD is not going to win all the time, sometimes, but not all the time. Um, and I'm willing to have these conversations. I'm not, I never back out from an argument. I'm like, let's go, like, let's do it. It'll be friendly. It'll be fun. But like, I will not take it easy on you. If you ask me a question, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be nice about it. And I'm going to in humor when I can, because that's just like how I speak, but I'm not going to protect your feelings. And so I think people understand that and they just, they're like, okay, like I'm not, I'm not going to try. Like God knows that I can't convert this one, (laughs) you know? So I'll be forgiven for that. I think. It's interesting. Do you, do you ever get people that do kind of Christians who do seem, seem to just kind of have written you off? Like you're a lost cause at this point. Um, yes. As a, as like a, a faith type situation, but not as a friend. Um, I have a lot of Christian friends and I think they understand that like, there's literally nothing they can do for me, but also part of, you know, especially Southern American Christianity is love the sin or hate the sin. So they think that by like remaining in my orbit, just close enough to like, be able to say that they've like, they've, you know, given me a shoulder to lean on. They're still doing their Christianly duty. Like I'm not giving up on her. Um, I'm not going to listen to anything she says. (laughs) And like, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to feed into that, but I never gave up on her, Mm. which I appreciate. It's funny you say that. I, I feel like I, I definitely had a lot of people give up on me direct, like directly. I think part of it I, I've I've wondered about is an intimidation factor of like, you know, I, I've preached for years in front of hundreds of people. Uh, you know, yeah. I've, I've memorized thousands of verses. I was in ministry. Like, what are you going to tell me that I didn't already know? Like, the, the, you know, like, there's not much you can add to the discussion that right. I haven't already actually not just heard before, but actually preached myself. But Yep. It surprises me still, having said that, that, you know, if you really believe I'm on the way to a, a burning fire, and most of the Christians in my circles did believe in a literal hell, do believe in it, like, you're not even going to try. And even the closest people to me, they just are like, I guess, you know, I guess it is what it is. Like, Tim's just, he's falling away. And that's, that's, you know, just, I will. And it, but it's like, if you really believe, like you started with, if you really believe you're going to try, you would think. Um, but most of them don't anymore, which is, or uh, never have in this whole process. I've been out for almost four years and uh, almost no one in my circle of friends has reached out and said, Hey, I just want to let you know, I, I really want to have a deep conversation with you, which kind of hurts because, but I think in some ways it's, it's helped me to see who, who's like my real people. Like you feel like Christians are your real people so much. And you realize you never actually cared about me. You cared about my theology you cared about what I could do for you in the church and the kingdom, but you didn't, you weren't in love with me. You were in love with Jesus in me. And if Jesus isn't in me, then I'm not lovable in one sense and not even acceptable. But I was curious with them. Um, I'm sorry. You're going to respond. Can, can I make just oh, a please, comment? Yeah, what go you for just it. Said? yeah. If I were you, I would actually um, be proud of that. I wouldn't take it personal or be upset by it because I think what you've done if you is you have established yourself as somebody who knows what he's talking about and has the answers and they are scared of the answers they're not afraid of you they don't hate you even though in their mind they equate you with that i think it means that you do such a good job proving your point that they're scared if they get too close to you they will also start questioning those things and they would rather just fade into the background than maintain a relationship with you that involves those questions yeah if i had to guess agreed agreed and i I was i was gonna say too i think one of the interesting things about some of those people that we've been talking about is i think in past generations they've been able to be more sheltered but with the internet age and all that's come with it like being sheltered is is not an option as much and this kind of sort of goes back to to your comment about letting kids explore the questions because like you know, 30, 40 years ago, you could have kept kids at bay and said, you know, we'll just give you the simple answer, but there's no, there's no real wizard behind the curtain. You know, just forget about your hard questions. We'll give you the simple question, simple answers, and you just have faith. And a lot of people just said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll take that route. But these days people can get access to so much more information so fast that the sheltering that was okay a generation or two ago, it just, it just can't happen the same way anymore, which to me is a, is a great thing, of course. Yeah. Um, but I was I was curious with with um I mentioned Christian nationalism before. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like that's on your radar at all in terms of one of the concerns on your heart as to whether or yes. not this country is in danger? 
Yes. I actually did an entire episode uh, with a guest who's uh, nice. a lawyer that fights against white Christian nationalism. Um, and I think it's a horrible problem. And I think it's toxic. And I think it'll only get worse. I think as we see the numbers climb in people leaving religion, we will see at least the attempt made to remove more and more rights and freedoms of people, um, which is ironic because for Christianity being such a free will type idea, they sure have to make it illegal to not be one. They like, yeah. you know, they're like, oh yeah, you have free will. You can make whatever decisions you want. So you do. And they're like, whoa, whoa, not like that. Hold on. I, I have to tell Congress about this. You're not, you're not doing what I told you you could choose to do. Wait, wait a second. And so I think as the younger generation um, segue is more and more and more secular, the older generations will start like putting the, the hammer down. I got one right here. We'll start putting the hammer down on Christian ideology, Christian rules, just straight up like boomer rules. Just like, no, don't be promiscuous. Why? Because, because why? Because does it cost you money? No, but I wasn't allowed to do it. So you're not either. <laughs> like that's their whole thing is like, I didn't get to do these things. So you shouldn't get to do these things. That's just how I feel. My feelings are just a lot. And so I do think we'll we'll see in the next like five years, a major push for fundamentalism in America. And then all those people will die. And then we'll have like room for <laughs> progress. But we, unfortunately, we have to wait for those people to die. We have to wait for the old people who are making these terrible um, evangelical fundamentalist pushes for the integration of church and state to die. And mm. then we'll have some some progress. So it'll look bleak. It'll look bleak for probably the next five to 10 years. But after that, I really think we will make major strides in the direction of a secular nation. Mm. I would love to see that. I don't know if, if I'll live long enough to see it and to the extent I'd love to, but it'd be really cool to, to see that. And just, just to see too, to I like to think about, and I don't, I don't want to distract us too much from the main yeah. topics, but just to think like the people at the very top of our government, like a lot of them, a huge percentage of them truly believe in mythology as their basic worldview. Like the Supreme Court is stacked with people who think that the mythology of the Bible is reality. And like, that's a scary thought. You know, that sometimes the people who have their ac have the only access on the planet to you know nuclear weapons to the hit that red button they believe in you know end times and a Jesus coming back on on a white horse and it's like that's scary like I would love to have people at the top level with the most authority who are secular who have a much more scientifically grounded perspective but we'll, uh, we'll definitely do our keep doing our best to to keep that conversation going I wanted to ask just as we um wrap up I wanted to ask there's a lot of people that probably listen to our shows who are just exploring. I know back in the day, you know, it was like, you know, don't, don't look at those kind of shows, but you know, hopefully these days there's a little more freedom that people have to just, even if they're just coming to be a better uh, apologist and to learn how to defend against stuff like what we do, but well, for whatever reason that they're showing up, there may be some of those people in that mix are having some serious questions and doubts. Maybe they had them before they came, maybe something you said, or one of your guests says, prompts a thought like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. But once they start to let that that ball roll a little bit, it starts to shake them up. They might be at that point where they're like, okay, well, I got some decisions to make. I got to figure this out because, you know, life was, you know, real simple five years ago. Now it's not so simple mm -hmm. anymore. And maybe they're actually scared about the implications of what you or someone has brought up. Um, for someone that's just starting where life's kind of getting, it was black and white a while ago. And now it's really gray and really messy. What would you say to someone who is thinking, I don't know if I'm going to deconstruct or deconvert, but I sure am, I sure I'm changing and I'm changing in a way that's a little more, a little faster than I expected. What would you say to someone in those kind of shoes? I would say congratulations on changing. Um, change in general is a good thing. Um, I think that things like cancel culture and things like that have made us feel like we're not allowed to publicly change because, you know, we used to say things with such like confidence and gusto, and then we don't agree with those things anymore. And we're afraid oftentimes to admit that we changed. So embrace the change. Congratulations. As long as you're not physically harming yourself, you know, by like doing a bunch of cocaine or something like that. Um, congrats. Explore that. Who are you? Who are you now? Allow yourself to explore that. Ask yourself, 
any questions that you come up with, even the scary ones. Think about it this way. If God were real, do you not think that he would forgive you for asking these questions and exploring these answers? If God is real, don't you think he would be appreciative of the fact that you did your research, you started looking things up, you started asking questions, and maybe you eventually come back to him? Don't you think that he would want you to do that? Probably would, right? So ask your, you should always question everything. You should question what you're hearing on the news. You should question what you're hearing um, from your friends on Facebook, from your teachers, from your professors. Even if you are a Democrat and you're watching a Democrat news association on television, question what they're telling you. Look into it. Research everything. Religious, non-religious, political, non-political. If I say the sky is blue, look out the window and make sure that the sky is blue because it does not matter what somebody claims to be or what somebody labels themselves at the point where they are telling you to not question everything. That's a problem. You don't want to be an atheist who doesn't question everything. You don't want to be a Christian who doesn't question everything. You don't want to be a non-atheist, non-Christian, spiritual being who doesn't question everything. Question literally everything. If somebody tells you Cracker Barrel is a great restaurant, try it. Try it. Don't just just don't just believe them. Try it. It is, by the way. I can attest it's very delicious. It's my favorite fast food chain. I thought um, you were gonna go somewhere else with that answer. Wow, you just you just shocked me. <laughs> no, I love Cracker Barrel. I, I that is a hill that I will die on. Cracker Barrel is delicious, and also I have a harmonica from them, um, which is weird. But yeah, question everything. If you're like, I feel like I'm changing, embrace it. The worst thing you can possibly do for yourself is stay the same, right? Worst case scenario, you change and it's a phase and you go back. At least now you know what that phase is like, right? The worst thing you can do for yourself is stifle your questions, stifle your curiosity, not embrace change. I thought when I was like 19, 20, 21, I thought I was literally perfect. I thought I was a genius. I thought I was just like, I thought I was just it, right? I walked around with so much like peacock confidence and I hate that bitch, nowadays if old me and current me had met we would not get along we would not get along i would hate her she would hate me i am my favorite version of myself that i've ever been at this point because i've just i've had my miley moment i've gone off the rails i've shaved my head i've done all sorts of stuff that people tell you you can't do and guess what it's fine i shaved my head people didn't like it my hair is back Talker right? Like you can, you can try anything, question anything. I don't recommend drugs because those will kill you. So don't do that. Don't do anything that you know for a fact can kill you, please. Um, But even if, even if at the end of the day, you're like, I still feel like a Christian. Okay, great. I believe you because you questioned everything. You did your research. You looked up what you needed to look up. Um, I, I 100% believe you if that's what you're saying to me. If you say, I'm an atheist, it's like, great. I believe you too. Congratulations. Welcome to the club. We have some pretty cool events. Um, but question everything. People think that I'm out here trying to convert people to atheism. I am not because that is literally what I didn't like about Christianity was converting people, proselytizing. And it is possible to become a prosthetic, prosthetic, whoops, not a fake, a, a proselytizing um, atheist. Like you can take everything that you hated about religion and accidentally, if you're not careful, apply it to atheism. And then you're in another religion. It's just called atheism, right? Um, but I just tell people, question everything you are told. Anybody who has a problem with it is a red flag, whether they're religious or they're not. If somebody tells you like, oh, don't worry about it, just go with it, no matter who they are, stay away from that person. Because that is either a person who um, is indoctrinated into a certain belief, or they know what you'll find if you question things and they don't want you to find it. And they are purposely stopping you from finding it. Even if they think they're doing it out of like the grace of God, that's a problem. I don't want to worship a God who doesn't want me to be curious about stuff. I don't want to worship a God who put things into the world and then was like, don't read those. <laughs> right. Like, I don't want to worship a God who created atheism and then was like, yeah, by the way, don't listen to them or talk to them or interact with them. This is the same person who planted a tree in a garden and then told people they weren't allowed to eat the fruit on that tree. Like that's messed up. Like that's messed up, right? If you wouldn't do it to your child, if you wouldn't set something in front of your child and be like, don't touch this or I'll beat you. Why, why would God do that? Right. That's messed up. So yeah, I said all that to say, question everything, 
you can, they can email me. Um, I can, I can give you my email or they can contact me through the the website growing up fundy podcast.com. I would love to email back and forth with them. I can hop on StreamYard and have a conversation with them that I don't post anywhere. We just have a conversation. You are not alone. If you are feeling like you have questions, I promise you there are millions of us out here, like 10% of us maybe have YouTube channels or whatever. There are millions of us out here. There is a community for you. It might be online, but we exist. We're out here. We're real people. We've asked the same questions. We've been through the same thing. Some pe- some of us are still going through it and that is okay. And I hope you stay changed. I hope whatever you decide to change into, you allow yourself to change and experience those things. And I wish them the best. Hmm. Good answer. Good answer. I love it. I would, I would do all that. And just to say as weird as it feels at first, like it, do, it really does get better. And I mean, yes. for some of us, it gets better pretty quick. I I was, I like to tell people I, I had more peace in the first hour than I did in 40 years as a Christian, but there's people that where that, that journey is not quite so fast, but right. it does, you do get grounded. It does get better. And the, the weirdness passes. And eventually you, like you said, with your personality, you know, a few years ago, like you realize, like I, I would have, been horrified to think I could have been stuck in this till the day I died. I'm so glad I escaped and changed. So but, glad. Yes. Yeah. And then yes. the piece, the piece is, is huge. Well, I do want to wrap up by asking, bringing it kind of back to where we started from. We started with your bio in your bio. You're just like you, number one, you're just doing so much stuff. Number yes. two, you're creative. Number two, you're obviously very funny um, with all that in the mix. What is on your radar for the next year or two in terms of things you haven't uh, done yet that are kind of, you know, on the back burner, you're just thinking through, you know, making notes about what you might do, but what, what is your creativity about to inspire that's going to come on the scene in the next few years? Oh man. So I, my goal is to make as, as much of an income with the podcast as I possibly can without charging the listeners anything. I never mm-hmm. want this information to be behind a paywall. Even a dollar ninety nine is too much for some people to be able to pay. So I would love to um, like bolster my Patreon, you know, get more ad revenue from YouTube, but I never ever want to charge people for exposure to this information. So I would love to not have to have like multiple jobs going on and just focus on the podcast. That would be just a wonderful thing. But again, it is not anybody's responsibility who's listening to me to make that happen. That's just a goal for myself to produce enough content that maybe, you know, through YouTube or whatever, I make enough revenue through my my podcast platform. So that's a goal. Um, And then I also am about to finish grad school. So hopefully I survive that. It's been, thanks. It's, it's, it's rough going. We're getting there though, but not a lot of sleep is happening. What would your Um, degree be in? A creative nonfiction. So like storytelling and, and memoir writing. Um, But I, if, if you had asked me five years ago, that same question, I would have had a direct answer. It would have been like, keep doing stand up, living in Chicago the rest of my life until I die, yada, yada, yada. Nowadays, I am embracing whatever just comes at me. I know that this time next year, I will be living a totally different life. Hopefully the podcast will still be a part of that life, but I know that I will probably be living in a different place, maybe doing different things, meeting new people, being a part of different projects. I have no idea what that looks like, but I'm like, I'm, I'm in this era where I'm just embracing opportunities that come. So I don't know. We'll see. I probably won't be doing stand-up anymore, to be honest with you. Um, that seems like a chapter that the further I get, the the more it's kind of closing. I feel like this podcast gives me, and like talking to people like you, I feel like that makes so much more of an impact and a difference than stand-up ever could. And it's been fun and it it served me well. But I think that my I'm starting to realize that my, I think my purpose here is to do things like this, to have these conversations with people, to be a a first influence of people to like the realm of atheism maybe in like a friendly way maybe in like a humorous comedic way um but yeah i don't know i have no idea i maybe i'll have more parrots maybe i won't (laughs) hopefully i won't have less parrots there's none of them that i would like to not have anymore on most days um but yeah i don't know i guess we'll see i said all that to say i have no idea (laughs) i love it i love it i would i would do that too it's I love how you just said, like, you don't know where you'll be and, you know, things will change in a year. And as a Christian, I remember the phrase seize the day was, uh, you know, carpe diem was huge in my mind in the sense of like, 
sees the day for Christ, of course, sees the day for the gospel, the kingdom, for the Bible. Reason. But it's still like the seize the day concept has absolutely transferred over. It's like now you realize you need to seize the day, not for eternity, but because the day is all you've got. Like seize the day because when it's over, that's your day. That's you it. Don't, you don't get another day. Um, but to really seize it and to leave, as I like to say, leave the planet better than you found it, but just to truly make a difference. And it feels like that pressure, you know, just, I just feel like, you know, life's moving on. And um, I try not to let that get me down too much because it can get you down. But at the, at the same time, it's like, it's an inspiration to say, yeah, well, don't let, don't let the passing of time get you down too much, but also recognize that that is an inspiration to say, make your life count. Life's not about just watching six hours of football on a Sunday, you know, like make a difference in the world. What do you need to do to, to pe- no, not to people know my name or even my platform, but just that people feel an influence and say the world truly got better because of these conversations or because of something he created. And that means such a, a big deal to me too, to just be like, be open to the change and make a difference. And yeah. wherever, wherever yeah. the winds take me, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll keep on doing my best to hopefully, you know, what we just look inward first and say, what do I need to do to be the best person I can be? But then to take our talents and use them to hopefully help people. Cause I think to the, the idea, you know, there's a lot, a lot of kids shows I've got little four little kids, but a lot of these kids shows, you see this idea of like, when, when there's a problem, the kids should look for the helpers, like where are the helpers? And I know Mr. Rogers used to talk about that and other, other ch- channels do it where they're, they're trying to help kids understand that whenever life is in a mode, in a mode of upheaval and life is difficult, that there are people around you that do care. There's, you know, whether it's a policeman or fireman, whatever, there's people that care, look for the helpers. They'll, they will help you through this, these hard times. And at the same time, I think that's been a big goal of mine to say, okay, well, there's people around you who are looking for helpers. What can you do to prepare yourself so that when the moment comes, I could be somebody's helper. Um, You know, you never know, you never know, but there are people that will reach out and say, you know, like to me at this point, Christianity is just, more academic it's mythology but to some people like this is life and death this is real like this hurts this is crazy hurt crazy bad hurt and to them it's like they're not out yet and they still need mm-hmm. help like and they're dying inside over this and i'm like it's, it's nothing to, it truly means nothing to me both it means everything to them and they need someone who can walk them through it and and, and care about them and not make fun of them of course but just right let's, let's walk you know, hand in hand through this together yeah the worst thing that ever happened to me was dating an atheist a mm. militant atheist because that that whole I told you so attitude kept me pushing for years after that. So I totally agree. Be positive influence on people, regardless of what side you're on. Be a positive influence. Be somebody they can come to and talk to and ask questions to and not feel judged or like keep secrets from. Absolutely. 100%. Mm, well said. Well, I do want to encourage everybody here to wrap up again. Please go like and subscribe. The, the podcast again is called Growing Up Fundy. Uh, go like, subscribe, and check out all the great stuff there. I've seen several of your interviews, not all of them, so I need to catch up on some more of your great work. Um, but can people, can I ask this, um, if somebody feels like they would be a good candidate for an interview, can they just reach out to you for that as well? Yeah, so I have a submission form. It's in the comments okay. of any episode, no matter what platform it's on. Just scroll down to the very bottom, and the last link will be, uh, like it'll it'll be labeled as well. It's my submission form. It's just a Google Doc. You can just fill out. It just gives me a little details on your background. Um, and it's not to decide whether or not you're worthy to be a guest. It just helps me just des- decide like which side you fall on or what order to you know to put your episode in. Um, but yeah, you can find it on the website, growingupfunnypodcast.com. You can find it in the comments of any video, any audio any platform at all you can find it on the facebook page it's one of the pinned posts at the very top it is all over the place or worst case scenario you can't find it you can just email me um and i'm happy to set you up with that awesome awesome well i'm i'm so appreciative of you sharing your story today um it feels like every everybody's story is different there's some serious overlaps but Mm -hmm. sometimes there's these little nuances and these little stories we go down and I, i love how yours has some very unique uh interesting parts to it so I also want to say thank you again for your for your platform. I know not everybody is at a spot where they can speak up, but I when I come across people that have, um, it really make, makes a difference to me because I know it for me it costs me quite a bit to do it, uh, yes. and I know you know it's, for some people it can truly be a costly endeavor, not Very in terms much. of f- finances, but just in terms of your 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 circle of friends and so forth. So thank you for being willing to, to be a public voice in this. No problem. Thanks for having me, and thanks for helping get the word out there and helping kind of expose me to your audience. I really appreciate it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll wrap up then by saying everyone we've been speaking with, Sydney Davis Jr. Jr. Sydney, thank you again. Awesome to get to know you.